On the radio one time, I heard a program discussing ticks and how to recognize them. The hosts mentioned the fact that ticks are born with six legs and grow an eighth pair later during development, and concluded that because arachnids have eight legs while insects have six legs, a tick must start off as an insect and become an arachnid later. Were they joking? Maybe. But let's unpack what's going on here because it is pretty confusing. At school, we tend to get taught biodiversity as a series of checklists. We're taught that if it has fur, makes milk, produces its own body heat, and gives birth to live young, it's a mammal. Except if it's a platypus, which lays eggs, or a whale, which doesn't have fur. Actually, some sharks give birth to live young and produce some of their own body heat, so why aren't they mammals if whales are? Is it that they produce milk? I don't produce milk. Does that mean that I'm not a mammal? It all seems horrendously arbitrary. Now what school biology tends to forget to mention, or what maybe some teachers don't fully realize, is that these criteria are not actually the definition of a mammal, just as having six legs is nowhere in the definition of an insect. These things are characteristics. Let's back up a second. There are different ways of talking about living things. You can refer to them by their general shape, or by the roles they fulfill in an ecosystem, but what we're talking about today are the formal, technical names given to particular species and the groups they belong to, like tick, or insect, or mammal. And these groupings are based on evolutionary history. Over time, species diverge into new species. Twigs on the tree of life become branches, and branches grow into boughs. The practice of figuring out this evolutionary history, and hence which groups belong together, a process which involves a lot of math and a lot of genetics, is called systematics. The practice of naming the branches on the tree is called taxonomy. People sometimes use these terms a bit differently, but this will do for our purposes. So then, what is the systematic definition of an insect? Well, it's the same as the definition of any living thing. This bunch of things that are all related. Or more technically, this extinct group of things and all of its living and dead descendants. Maybe you think this definition feels unsatisfactory? But if you feel this way, maybe it'll help to consider the following. Taxonomy is like geography. In geography, we understand the world we live in by dividing it up into bits and giving those bits names. Champs-Élysées is a street in Paris, which is a city in France, which is a country in Europe. These names and divisions within divisions are, in one sense, arbitrary. You could take Europe and split it up into any number of different divisions and subdivisions with different names, and indeed we have done that time and time again throughout history, but that doesn't change the fact that the actual land that we're dividing up and naming is a real thing that really exists and has a particular shape. You can draw a map of, say, Scandinavia that does or does not include Finland, depending on which definition of Scandinavia you think is most helpful, but no legitimate map has Thailand located just east of Hawaii because that's just not what the world looks like. Arbitrary does not equal meaningless. So in taxonomy, then, we understand the diversity of life by dividing it up into bits and giving those bits names. Instead of street, city, and country, we have species, genus, and family. Instead of continents, the thing that we're dividing up and naming is the gigantic evolutionary family tree of all living things. And, like in geography, while the names that we give are arbitrary, the tree of life is real, as in it's an abstract representation of a real history, and it only has one particular shape. Of course, there is one big caveat. At this point in history, we know what the map of our planet looks like. Meanwhile, our map of the Tree of Life is still improving over time as new evidence comes to light. So when two taxonomists disagree, they'll be arguing over whether one name should apply to a single large branch of the tree, or whether it's more informative to give each sub-branch its own name. Drawing borders on the map to help describe it. When two systematicians disagree, like over whether sponges or tenophores are the sister clade to all other animals, it really is more like arguing over the shape and location of a continent. So, maybe taxonomy is kind of like old-timey geography? Still, I like this analogy because it solves the problem of the six-legged tick by explaining how it isn't actually a problem of definitions. 
The characteristics we're taught for particular organisms and particular countries do help us recognize and talk about them, but they don't actually define them. Just as insects are characterized by having six legs, France is characterized by good food, pleasant climate, Catholicism, and the French language. There are probably many places in France that fulfill none of these criteria, and there are many places that fulfill all of them, but that doesn't make them part of France. France is the name we give to this bit north of Spain and south of Great Britain. A place on a map is entirely defined by its location relative to other places. And in the same way, a taxonomic group is entirely defined by its evolutionary position on the tree of life. Insects are defined by being descended from the original insects. But ticks are descended from arachnids, and that makes them arachnids, no matter how many legs they happen to have.